All right, if you have a Bible, Jeremiah chapter 10, Jeremiah chapter 10. Now this afternoon at 3.28 p.m. Central Time, I received an email that says this. On Radio Public, Jeremiah 23 and 24 sound a bit mushy, listenable, but not up to the usual standard. Witches and spectral evidence was good, excellent, sound, and outstanding content. That's good. I did not try other podcast platforms and then they named the type of computer that they are listening from. If for those who may not know, whenever I am here, I am using a lapel microphone versus the podcast microphone used at home, right? So it's going to sound radically different, right? The, the microphone for the podcast, you know, that's a podcasting microphone. This is a lapel mic, so there's just no way to get the same sound. It's, you know, attached to my collar. It's not going to sound the same. Like, I mean, I could carry the pod, podcasting microphone around, but no, I'm not doing that. So, uh, that, yeah, and of course, you know, the only other way would be then to build a, like a, a microphone into the pulpit, right? One of those pulpit mics. Then you have to run wires all the way into a computer. And then I, then I couldn't move around or like I'd have to, no. So now if you want to send us $10,000, by all means, we'll make all the upgrades that, that we can. But, but no, the, even, even if we made all the upgrades, it wouldn't be uh, much better than this. Maybe a little bit better. Uh, maybe we could get a better lapel mic and a better system. But I don't know if the improvement would be um, I don't know. Uh, I think I think some long-term listeners feel that this was this is actually better than the other lapel mic is what some said. But uh, if you notice a difference, that's the difference. The, these broadcasts, the ones that we're doing at church, completely different. I'm in a sanctuary, not in a little confined room. I, you know, the microphone is not right in front of my face with a pop filter. It's down on my you know, lapel. Um, it's a little mic, not a normal mic. So that's going to that's gonna make the differences. Um, I did try to go back and listen to uh, part 23 and part 24 today. I wasn't able to make it through all of them. I didn't hear anything too bad. Now, sometimes there are a little interference or something that can happen. But, um, you know, there's nothing, there's not much I can do. We did a lot of testing, trying to get it as as perfect as we can. And uh, I will listen to this. But if anyone else has any problems, then they can email me as well and tell me if there's a problem and if there's anything we can do to try to fix it within reason, we will, um, other than doing all of my sermons from home, okay? (laughs) So, so, I mean, I I could do that, right? I could do that, but uh, no. uh, So, But that's, that's the difference. Now, with all of that said, Jeremiah chapter 10. Now, this morning, we spent two hours in Jeremiah chapter 9, we kind of picked a kind of a certain kind of major the- a couple of major themes that we looked at, really dealing with how Christians deal with sin, right? How uh, Christians have a tendency to focus on other people's problems and not our own. So, uh, we talked about deception, a lot of just very important concepts that I think was not we did not put them into the text. I believe all of them came from the text. I believe we were fair to the text. Tonight we come to Jeremiah chapter 10. Oh boy, good old Jeremiah chapter 10. Unfortunately, we're going to have to spend probably a considerable amount of time dealing with the controversial part of Jeremiah chapter 10. And everyone knows the controversial part about Jeremiah chapter 10, right? Is everyone here familiar with the controversy surrounding Jeremiah chapter 10? This is the Christmas trees are evil chapter. This is the chapter that people use who condemn Christmas to condemn Christmas trees. All right? So um, we're going to look at that. Now, the the issue is, right? Now, just listen to me. This is important. When we look at Jeremiah chapter 10, first and foremost, we need to figure out what the chapter is actually about. I highly doubt it's about Christmas trees because one... Christmas didn't exist. Okay, all right. That's a good, that's a pretty good idea, right? Okay. 
Number two, so what some say is, okay, well, Christmas didn't exist, but the people who formed Christmas, you know, the Illuminati sitting in a dark room somewhere, they're like, you know what we'll do? We'll use the idol in Jeremiah 10 for a, and make it a Christmas tree, and then we'll get everyone committing idolatry. Okay, um, that, that's, I, I don't think it was that well thought out. I, I, don't, I don't think it was. And, and, I, and again, it depends on where you, you know, you can go all day with listening to the arguments about Christmas trees, right? Talking about their origins, you can go all day, right? Just so that you know when it comes to Christmas, just so you know, you basically have two schools of thought when it comes to Christians and Christmas, right? And, and I mean, I just came from Boston. Uh, in that area, Christmas was outlawed. It was banned, uh, because the Puritans banned Christmas. And, and so, so, that, so there's, there's a, a, a history of this, all right? So you really have a couple, just, just, and I don't want to spend all this time, but we have to just because every Christmas time, someone's going to quote Jeremiah 10, all right? So let's just kind of go through this. Here's the basic view. View number one is that Christmas is pagan in its origin, and so that we should all avoid it that Christmas basically copied ancient paganism, took its idea, they tried to Christianize it by putting Christ in it, but it really is ancient paganism. They chose the date to correspond with ancient paganism, and then they carried over some of the practices of paganism, like a Christmas tree, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They'll go through all the different things and say the origins of those things were pagan, therefore Christmas is pagan, therefore nobody should celebrate it. All right? That's view number one. Now, you may get some kind of modification of that, but that's the basic idea. The origin is pagan, therefore we should avoid it. View number two is uh, Christmas is the story of the incarnation of the Son of God. That is a biblical event, right? Therefore, it's perfectly okay to celebrate that. Hey, it's perfectly okay to celebrate it. Yes, they chose December the 25th. And you can say, ooh, there was some grand conspiracy. But I don't know if you've ever seen a calendar of world religion, right? If you take a calendar and look at every religion, every pagan practice, everything from witchcraft to Satanism to Buddhism to, you, to Islam to Judaism, you go through every religion in the world, it almost will not matter what day you pick. Because it's probably going to fall on some day associated with something. Not only that, even the days of our week. Monday, too, they are associated with Greek gods, right? In the, in the name of our months, you go on and on and on. It's like no matter what, everything has some correlation with something, right? So here's the thing. When you open your Bible... Does it tell you the day and the month and the time of the birth? Is there a birth announcement going on this day at 2.22 a.m.? Jesus was born seven pounds and three ounces. No, it's, it's not. So they had to choose a date to remember it. I don't care what happened on any other day. I don't care what it's associated with. It has no bearing on me. The issue is what we are remembering, is it biblical? yes. Now, the question is, now this becomes the question. How can we celebrate that? What can we add to that celebration before we go to, like, that's always the debate, right? And I've said, for, I've said it a million times. What is the worst thing that ever happened to Christmas as far as Christians are concerned? Making it a federal holiday. Because the minute you made it a federal holiday, what did you make it? It's a secular holiday. And if it's a secular holiday, what is the culture going to do with said holiday? Well, it's not even about secularizing it. They're just going to add what they want to it because they don't, I mean, they're not looking at it from a religious perspective. So all kinds of things come in on December the 25th. What All the things that come in, right? All of those things come in and then Christians are caught in kind of a middle, right? Because you want to celebrate Christ, 
if they would have just kept it as a celebration of Christ and not made it a federal holiday, it, it would have been, I mean, the world wouldn't care. The world wouldn't care. Right? There's all kinds of holidays. But once you, once you, once, once the world kind of started going, oh, a lot of people celebrate this and then make it a federal holiday and then, oh, gifts are involved, then it becomes financially <laughs> motivated. Right? So you can see how it works. And then Christians get caught in the middle. So you got those Christians who are just like, avoid it. Now you got other Christians say celebrate it, but then they say you got to keep this out of your celebration and this out of your celebration. And then everyone debate. And sad, what happens is on DC, as it gets close to Christmas, everyone forgets Christ. And everyone fights. And everyone argues. You have a Christmas tree in your house. You have an idol in your house. How dare you, right? And someone else is like, we're going to give gifts. How can you give gifts? It's the birth of Christ. You don't get a gift. And then, and, 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 wait, and then everyone, they argue the day, what you do, what decorations you should or shouldn't have. Should you drink eggnog? Don't drink, drink eggnog. Should you watch Charlie Brown Christmas special? Do you watch Rudolph? Well, like, what do you, everyone has a million opinions. And, and, and I've often said, because people hate, hate when I say this, I, I loathe Christmas. I loathe it. I hate it. I, I literally despise it because all it is is never ending arguing and debating. That's why I, 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 do, I do better with other holidays where there's less debate. But Christmas, it's just, and it doesn't matter what I say on the podcast. I can say, if I... It doesn't matter what I do, right? If I say, Merry Christmas, I'll get emails. How dare you say Merry Christmas? Don't you know it's a pagan holiday? How dare you promote paganism? If I don't say Merry Christmas, wait, are you, are you a part of the woke mob that wants to get rid of Christmas? There's a war on Christmas. And I just, it just you know what? I, I don't, I don't, it's, I just don't care. It, it, it drives me crazy, right? And I do understand it is, it is difficult for a Christian to figure out what to do, Right? What do you add to your Christmas celebration before it's no longer about Christ? That's a hard question to ask. I don't have any easy answers, right? Now, it's easy if you're single or you're just two adults who live by yourself. But once you bring children into the picture, it's like, what do I do here? What do I do? 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 Because no matter what you do, they're going to tell you how you did it wrong when they get older, right? Okay, so I... I don't know the easy answer, but I, it's just, so those, kind of the, those are the kind of the schools of thought, right? That, hey, it's a biblical holiday, so we can celebrate it, and we don't really care about the day that they picked. But even, in that, even within that group, there's a lot of debate on what you can and can't do. The other side is just abandon it and don't celebrate it in any way, shape, or form. And, and, and then you'll hear that, that side always say, show me one verse that says we are to celebrate the birth of Christ. And I'm like, well, show me one verse that we're supposed to celebrate anything, okay, right? I mean, at that point, right? So, I mean, it, like, that's just a ridiculous argument. The point is, does the Bible talk about the event? So then, obviously, we can celebrate it and remember it, right? So, I mean, that's just a ridiculous thing that people say. So, Yeah, I mean, yeah, and it's repeated. It's talked about in more than one gospel. So, I mean, like you would think that maybe it's something that we could. But all right, people can have that debate. In the meantime, we got Jeremiah chapter ten to deal with. All right, and we could talk more about Christmas. But here's the thing: we cannot allow ourselves to miss the actual meaning of the text for the supposed Christmas trees. Okay, we can't let the Christmas trees supposedly blind us from the meaning of the text. Now, we've been reading, we've read every single word of Jeremiah chapter 1 to 9 at this point. We do know God is very upset with both Judah and Israel. And one of the things he's upset with uh, about them over and over and over again is what issue? Idolatry. Idolatry. So we know that the main issue is idolatry. So if you're going to try to attach this to a Christmas tree, let me just throw something out at you. I don't think it's the Christmas tree that is ever the idol for people on Christmas. Okay, 
The idol on Christmas could be a million things. It's not the tree, ladies and gentlemen, okay? It could be what? It could be the gifts, okay? It could be family. It could be so many other issues. Could time off from work. It could be so much. Basically, things that make you, what's, what's always the idol? The self. Self is always the idol, right? So there's a million things that happen at Christmas that make us happy, that we like, that give us good feelings. And we love to do all of those things that make us happy, to give us warm feelings, time with family, sitting around doing whatever people do at Christmas. to get, And they love that, that, that time of the year, the feeling. And that makes it all about us. It's not the tree, ladies and gentlemen. It's not the tree, okay? It's not the tree. It, I, if, if the only issue we had with idolatry in December was a tree, then okay, then we could just keep the tree out of the house and everybody could be like, oh, we've resolved the problem. But I don't think that's the issue here. Let, let's just take a look at it and see if we can figure it out. That sound good? All right. Jeremiah chapter 10. First one. I'm already going to get emails already. I'm going to be like, it's July. Send me your Christmas emails in December. Okay, all right. All right, here we go. All right. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 1. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Now, the main thing to realize is this seems to indicate a change that the sermon at the temple have, it has ended. All right. Now, God is going to give a message, and this message is to the house of Israel. Now, either we understand this to be what? We've got a couple of options here. How do we understand the house of Israel here? Just the northern tribe or the entire nation, both north and south, right? Just combined, all right? We'll see if we get anything specific here. We do know the north is where at this time? There are, they've, been, they've been in basically Assyrian captivity about a hundred years before Jeremiah, all right? So, and sometimes he does make references to them. And the reason he makes references to them is just so that you remember the nation doesn't exist, but the people still exist, okay? All right, here we go. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. All right, seemingly a very simple warning here is that they are not to learn what? The way of the heathen, the way of the nations. I think primarily this is going to be focused on not learning what? Idolatry, which Israel has been doing pretty much their entire history, right? Pretty much their entire history, okay? And it says not to learn it. Now, what do you think it means about not being dismayed At the signs of the heaven. Or be terrified at the signs of the heavens. Even though the nations are. What do you think it's referencing? They say most likely this is referencing unusual phenomenon like an eclipse, a comet, a meteorite, or something else, right? Something else. So in other words, something happens in the heavens that they don't quite understand. They can't quite figure out what it means. Now, you know, in ancient history, if something was happening in the heavens that they could not quite understand, they would immediately assume Something like the end of the world was happening. God was upset. They need to sacrifice something. They, they, would, they would panic, right? Because they couldn't understand it. And if you can't understand it, then you, you, have, you, you try to do something to appease it because they would uh, assign whatever was happening that God was angry with them or something was angry with them and they would try to appease it. He tells them to not do what? Do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are what? Are vain. Are vain. Now, this is where we get here. Now, the idea, the customs of the people are primarily going to be referencing what? 
idolatry. I, th I think we're going to be able to see that. I think well, you can tell me if you, if you agree or disagree. But primarily the issue is their idolatry. And so that, that it's empty, it's meaningless. Now, possibly what he is saying here is, hey, don't be as frightened at all of these things and be so frightened that you end up following the customs of the people because they turn to something to appease whatever it may be and it is vain. Now, I could be wrong. I think some commentaries go with this kind of concept that maybe what Jeremiah is getting ready to do is that these people have may see their captivity, see the Babylonians, see the Assyrians, whatever the case may be, and think the way to appease their dilemma to appease their captivity or to save them from their problem is to follow the customs of the heathen as a way to appease or to solve their their problem and he's telling them that it is vain now i don't know if that's going to play out but let's go with this now look what happens for one does what cutteth a tree out of the forest the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe they deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. All right. They cut down a tree and they do, they do what with it? Okay, they work it, okay? Okay, basically, they turn it into some kind of an idol. Now, I know the language definitely, you could say, ooh, it sounds like a Christmas tree, all right? But even if it sounds like a Christmas tree, remember, the issue is, it's not the object, right? Because you could go so far to say, is don't even have any trees in your yard, right? Do not have any, like, that's just ridiculous. It's not the object, it's what is being done with the object, Right? In this case, they're cutting the tree down. They're doing all of this because it is an idol. They're making an idol. Okay? All right? And then what else does it say? They deck it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers and that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. Now, sometimes I wish people who use this for Christmas trees would remember that part. Stop being scared of the Christmas tree. It's a tree, okay? It can't do anything to you. It cannot harm you. Now, yes, if you walk in, uh, you know, you put up the Christmas tree, and the next morning, your wife is... Like, oh, mighty tree, and starts worshiping the tree. Now, the issue isn't even the tree. The issue is your wife worshiping the tree. It's not the tree's fault. Agreed? Okay, it's not. The, and I, again, it's just crazy because a lot of people who's like, we're not going to do a Christmas tree. They'll still spend $5,000 on presents. Well, what do you think the people are worshiping? The presents. So then the argument is, should you even do presents? But I would say, like, it's just, it's a never-ending debate, right? I mean, there's just no, like, the, it's a no-win situation. I, again, the best thing that to have ever had, the, uh, the worst thing to ever happen was making it a federal holiday. If it wasn't a federal holiday, just guess how much of those things wouldn't even exist. But anything that gets associated, once, once society buys into the holiday, they're, they're obviously going to turn it into something other. What do they do with Easter? Yeah, they, they, they look for another way to, to sell it. It's about barbecues and picnics and new clothes and candy and egg hunts. None of that has anything. Now, the weird part about that is the church bought into all of that just as much, which is, once again, weird. The church always has this weird dilemma, right? With, with buying into all of these, it has nothing to do with the resurrection of Christ. None of that has anything to do with the resurrection of Christ. So once again, when it, if you're going to say this Sunday, we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 
then as a Christian, what do you do? do you, then do you show up with new clothes? I mean, I, I, what is that supposed to represent? I don't know. I don't know. Is it supposed to represent? And then people will try to spiritualize. Well, it represents that because of the resurrection of Christ, I'm now clothed in the perfect. Re- just stop. You wanted a new outfit. Just stop. Okay. Just stop. Okay. It, it just it drives. It just we try to spiritualize. Well, the egg represents new life. No, you're just doing an Easter egg hunt because that's what the world. Just stop it. Okay. So um, the, the Christians will buy into that stuff just as much. It would be the best thing that would have ever happened is if the world just left them all alone. And we would come together on, at, at church and go, this Sunday, we're going to remember the incarnation. And this Sunday, we're going to remember the resurrection of Christ. No new clothes are involved. No potluck. No egg hunt. No bunny. No, anything like that. And it would just be that. And wouldn't it be great? At least for me, it would be great. And then, and then have other holidays where you can do all of that other stuff, right? Some other holidays. And then we could decide if we want to celebrate those holidays or not. But it, no, it, it all gets mixed together. But you can see, the main thing is I want you to realize is what does he tell them about the trees? Do not be afraid of them. They cannot do evil. Neither uh, neither also is it in them to do good. They're not going to do anything for you. They can't hurt you. They can't do anything for you because it's just a tree that's been cut down, turned into an idol, and decorated. That's all it is. It cannot do anything. Everyone forgets that part of the verse. All right, verse 6. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Now, what, what's interesting? What is verse 6 doing? Contrasting. The nothing that can't do anything, and then how does God describe in verse 6? Look at the way he's described. The great God. Great in might, meaning he can do something, Right? All right, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it uh, appertain, for as much as among all the wise men of the nations and all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. But they are altogether brutish and foolish, and stock is a doctrine of vanities. Silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish, and gold from Euphaz, the work of the workmen and the hands of the founder. Blue and purple is their clothing. They're all the works of cunning men. So he's just contrasting God with all the things men can produce, all the things men can do. And is there any ultimate comparison? No, no, we could get into getting to the specifics of what he's referencing there. But all of that, I mean, you know, it may be wonderful. It may be great. But for our purpose here... He just wants them to see that basically all of the idolatry, all of these things is useless in contrast to God. So in a roundabout way, what should Israel and Judah not do? Turn to idols to fix their problem or to help them in their time of need. That makes perfect sense, yes? All right. And just, just we'll just be, because we're now kind of moving past the Christmas tree, just so that you know, there's always these debates about the origin of Christmas trees. Some people trace it back to Luther, where Luther uh, supposedly cut down a tree, put candles on it to say that it represents that Christ died on the cross on a tree for us, that it grows, so he brought forth fruit, which is us, and then the can- lights that are candles that would be put on it represents his glory. Others will question that story. You can go on all day debating it, debating it, debating it, depending on which book you get. Who, I, I don't understand the never-ending debate over the subject. Of all the issues to deal with, you know what I'm saying? Like, I wish the only thing I had to worry about in my life was whether to have a Christmas tree or not, right? I don't know about you. I typically have far more greater sins to worry about than that. Agreed? But every Christian, now I will say this, though. Every Christian does strongly have to, I will say this as a challenge. 
I don't care if it's Christmas. I don't care if it's Easter. Every Christian does have to figure out what they're doing on those days and why you're doing them. You do have to figure out what you're doing, right? Because if you're going to say the day is about Christ, you can't contradict yourself in everything else you do, right? You can't say, today is about the resurrection of Christ. All right, kids, let's get a new dress and let's go Easter egg hunting. I, I think you're kind of telling everyone it's not really about Christ. Now, what, if, and if you remember what I, I, how I've always tried to handle it is typically the way we did things, not saying that it, you know, it's, it's perfect, but we usually tried to give the presents before Christmas Day, like sometimes leading up to it or on Christmas Eve right, to get those out of the way. And then on Easter, if we wanted to buy candy or do anything like that, we did that after the fact, like Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. Then you could hide the candy, let them run around, and it's not associated with what? With the resurrection of Christ. So they can still do all those things. You just separate it from the days that you're trying to make about what two events? The incarnation and the resurrection. Now, the reality is, does it really matter? Does it really... Do they go, I'm so glad you drew a distinction between... No, it, 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 it. Okay, right, no, they don't remember that. They, they, all they may remember is, I can't believe we didn't get to do that. It's, no, you did get to do it. You just didn't get to do it on that particular day. But that'll be still the end of the world for them. And, I, and I, it's a no-win situation, because what do you expect? If they're not saved, what do you expect them to do? To see the spiritual benefit of it? They see it as a punishment. And and that's always the hard part as a Christian parent is you're trying to impose, in many cases, a Christian ideal upon an unregenerate heart. And how well does that work? Doesn't. It doesn't. But that's that's the best you can do. But as a Christian parent, you have to try to figure, what do I want my kids to remember about this day? Well, you, you know, if you attach anything else to it, what are they going to remember? I mean, how, let's, come on, let's just be honest. How is the incarnation and the resurrection ever going to compete with Christmas presents or new dresses, new clothes, Easter egg hunt, cookout, picnic, whatever thing people do on those days, right? There's no way the Jesus stuff is going to be remembered. There's just no, there's just no way. Now, later on, they may then begin to appreciate the incarnation, but it's only because of their Christianity, not because of those events. And the churches, and many churches don't help. Churches cancel services on Christmas, right? They, they will, sunrise service, quick sermon, maybe some pancakes in the morning and a breakfast, and then Easter egg hunt in the afternoon. And, and you're just like, okay, well, what do I do? And some churches will even bring in someone dressed up like Santa Claus. You, or the Easter Bunny. And you're just like, what do you do? And, and you, now. Oh, I know. I, that's the first trouble I got in as a pastor. I know. is telling people that he wasn't real. You, you would think that that would. I ruined their childhood's life. I know, their child's life. I know. Uh, I was not prepared for that in seminary. Hey, you don't when you when you preach, don't mention the fact that something that doesn't exist doesn't exist. <laughs> Isn't that crazy that that's what I first got in trouble for? Of all the things I could get in trouble for, that that's what got me in trouble. Like you start questioning ministry really quick when you can't tell Christians that something that actually doesn't exist doesn't exist. If that gets you in trouble, you got to start questioning your entire involvement with Christianity. But okay. Verse 10, all right? And someone's going to email me and go, well, I don't know exactly how to navigate that as a parent. I have no answers for you. I don't have any answers for you. Good luck, right? Okay. And in and, and this church, I bet you everyone's had different practices, right? Everyone in this church has had different practices, right? Everyone here. How many open presents on Christmas Day? Okay, y'all changed. Yeah, so y'all just y'all y'all destroyed your children with inconsistency. Okay, all right, okay. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. When you have nine hundred kids, that they've all got raised different ways. Y'all did on Christmas every time, or did you ever change it? So they had consistency. All right, they had consistency, and y'all used like the Greek Orthodox uh, Christmas. Okay. 
Okay, I know which one. Their, their Christmas is like January the 6th, so I always joke. The, I think the first time that I heard that y'all did it in January, I'm like, are they Greek Orthodox? Okay, right. Okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, that's, that's good. And, and, and then that worked pretty good. So they, they moved their Christmas gift giving to J- New Year's Day. Okay. All right. Now, they, the kids had to wait, so I don't know if that did that. They, they, okay, now they love it. Okay, see, that worked out. Right? See, that worked out. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay, all right, well, see, that's, hey, if it works out, great. But that's a way of doing it, because I like that. You're moving it more to a secular holiday anyway. Right, right. Yeah, that's, that's, a, good, that's a good way, so, right? I mean, and, and, but that's, a, that's the, the key. And sometimes as a parent, all you can do is try to learn from other parents. Now, when you're young, what do we do as, as parents? Oh, we got it all figured out. I'm not going to be like those. We think we know it. We're going to, my kids are going to, and my kids are never going to do this. My kids are never going to do that. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, 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 yeah. And, and you do try that. Like, you know, okay, tonight, we're, before we open any presents, we're going to read Luke chapters one through three. Yeah, and the kids are like, oh, I loathe thee. Okay, right. I know, and sometimes the inconsistency drives me crazy because there's a lot of inconsistency with me, uh, with us as well. The, the only thing we ever try to do is try to make sure the presents were not on Christmas Day, but even that was not always consistent in how we did it because, because you're changing too. That's the hard part as a Christian is you're, you're trying to figure out Christianity while you're trying to raise them, and they don't ever sit back going, well, I understand that you were trying to figure out your faith as well. They're just like, why were you so inconsistent? And why did you do this? You hypocrite. It's like, okay, you know, I, I get it. But yeah, um, but yeah, that's a good idea for Christmas. Now, how, how did everyone do Easter? Different ways? New clothes? Nah. Yeah, I get the bigger, the bigger families are like, you're not getting anything new, right? But, you know, you probably went to some churches that did a lot of different things on Easter. Right? Okay, all right, okay, well, that's good. So it just, it just really depends. So, but I'm just saying, every, you get 10 Christian families together, and you'll get wildly different approaches, different, even in this church, we've had those who are 1,000% against Christmas trees. Said it was wrong. Someone wanted to bring a Christmas tree in here, and it turned into controversy. Like, oh, my, you're going to have a Christmas tree inside the... And, and it's like it's a tree decorated with lights. It's like, oh, no! Satan! Okay. Okay, see? Oh, my. Tossed every and, and, I, and look, I do understand that. When, when you're a young Christian, you're trying to figure it out. You're like... You don't know better. You know, you're like, oh, then I shouldn't celebrate that holiday. Now, hopefully over time, you continue to struggle and try to figure it out. The problem is when you're trying to figure it out as a parent and the kids are watching like, well, wait a minute, it was right. Now it's wrong. Wait, now it's right. That's the problem as a parent. That, uh, that's the hard part. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you got to love that, right? But yeah, but everyone has an opinion on it. Everyone has an opinion on it, and it, it's, I just hate that the fact that the holidays, that we just lose what they're about. So I just, just, let's just make it very clear. Jeremiah 10, that has nothing to do with Christmas trees, and even if it had to do with a Christmas tree, what does the text say about them? Don't be afraid of them. They can't do any evil, and they can't do any good, meaning they are absolutely worthless. And you know what that would be a lot like? Remember, there's going to be another issue that shows up for the church a lot later in a city called Corinth. What was the issue? Meat offered unto idols, right? And some were like, no, 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 you can't eat that meat. It was offered unto an idol. Now, Paul does say if it's going to cause someone to stumble, don't do it. 
But he says the idol is nothing. So it doesn't hurt you to eat it because it doesn't do anything to it unless you're assigning some supernatural power of the idol to then impact the meat. And then you eat the meat and you get a case of idolatry. I don't know what you get, but, but you can see you can get, see the issue. So these problems have been around for a very long time. And sometimes it almost borderlines in complete superstition. But you can see the issue. All right. So we have just a little ways to go here. All right. Verse 10. How much time do we have? All right. We got, we got, we got enough time to finish this chapter. All right. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble, and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. Are we getting an idea of what's now happening here? This is co- contrasting completely. God is something real, tangible, great, powerful, and all of this idolatry is vanity, meaningless, useless, and it can't do anything for you. Right. Uh, verse 11 Thus shall you say unto them, the gods that have not made, okay, thus shall ye say unto them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. What are you, what, what are you going to say to all of their idols? They're going to perish. They're going to burn up. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Meaning, God is the creator, not the idols. He's the one with power, not the idols. <coughs> I apologize for sneezing into the microphone. I was trying not to. All right. So I, 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 think, it, I think it's pretty clear what is happening here, right? Verse 13, when he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain, and bringeth forth the winds out of his treasures. Now, in a roundabout way, he told them not to be scared of the things in the heavens. And here is showing who's in charge of the things in the heaven. God. Right? Showing that God. That's why they shouldn't be afraid of anything. Right? Right? Every man, uh, verse 14, every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image for his molten image is falsehood and there is no breath in them. They are vanity and the works of errors and the time of their visitation, they shall perish. He's basically saying these things are useless and anyone who thinks anything different about them is, how does the King James say about their knowledge? Every man is brutish, is the King James. How's the NIV translate verse 14? Senseless in his knowledge. His every founder is confounded by the graven image. In other words, they are senseless. They are, they are, they are clueless because they are assigning some kind of power to this idol, to this image. It, doesn't, it can't speak. It can't do anything. It's useless. It's meaningless. So why are you showing... Why are you drawn to it? Why would you look to it? It cannot do anything for you. In fact, once again, what does he say about them at the end of verse 15? They shall perish. Uh, Verse 16, the portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the former of all things, and Israel is, is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Gather up thy wares out of the land, O inhabitant of the fortress, fortress. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will sling out the inhabitants of the land at this once and will distress them that they may find it so. Just meaning, once again, showing who's in charge. God is in charge. God is in charge. And then we have the last section. Woe is me for my hurt. My wound is grievous, but I said truly, This is a grief, and I must bear it. All right. Verse 19 seems a little confusing, maybe. What do you think is happening in verse 19? What do you think is happening in verse 19? I am going to pull up a commentary here. Okay. We definitely seem to have a, 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 something is happening here. Now, this is what one theory is. Jeremiah here 
is speaking or praying and the voice of someone enduring the Babylonian invasion to come. So he now is speaking or praying as if he's someone involved, who is involved in the Babylonian captivity. Now remember, the Babylonian captivity is still future. But he is speaking as someone who is, who is endure, enduring it. And look what, how it says, Woe is me for my hurt, my wound is grievous. But I said, truly, this is a grief and I must bear it. My tabernacle is spoiled and all my cords are broken. My children are gone forth of me and they are not. There is none to stretch forth my tent anymore and to set up my curtains. Now in verse 20, who does that sound like? Well, it's, he, it, they, they, they feel that he's still praying as if someone who is there and witnessing it, but he's using kind of a, an idea that he's it's speaking of Jerusalem. This is how one says, Jerusalem here is spoken of or personified as a tent-dwelling mother bereft of her children. That's a personification. Oh, it switches crazy. I know, I know, it switches crazy, Right? But clearly, what is it demonstrating? Whether we can identify the speaker and get into all the never-ending controversies maybe over it, what are we at least taking from it? Something bad is happening in verse 19. Can we agree? Someone is hurt, there is wound, there is grief. And then what? some of the things that are going on, the tabernacle is spoiled, most likely a reference to what? You can, you can, uh, you can possibly refer to the temple, but basically Jerusalem is being spoiled. All my cords are broken. My children are gone forth of me. They are not, there is none to stretch forth my tent anymore and to set up my curtains. Basically the idea that the children of Judah, the children of Israel are being what? Exiled and there'll be no one there to do what? To set up the temple or to worship in a correct way. What happens in the next verse? For the pastors are become brutish. What's the NIV's translation of brutish? Senseless. For thy pastors are become senseless and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper and all their flocks shall be scattered. Behold, the noise of the brute is come and a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate and a den of dragons. Who's the brute coming out of the north? Babylon. Babylon is coming. O Lord, I knew that the way of man is not in himself, it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. O Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Pour out thy fury upon the heathen that know thee not, and upon the families that call not on thy name, for they have eaten up Jacob and devoured him and consumed him and have made his habitation desolate. Jeremiah basically comes back in and says, okay, I know you're going to do all of this to us, do all of this not so much out of your anger, but out of a judgment or out of a way to purify us and to make us right. But then please do what? Bring judgment upon the nations. Bring judgment upon the nations who are doing these things. And that is Jeremiah chapter 10. Yeah, I mean, later the, those very nations will be Yeah, they're going to be judged. All right, any questions about Jeremiah chapter 10? How would we summarize Jeremiah chapter 10? Well, don't follow the nation's idolatry because it is nothing. In contrast to that is God who is powerful, great, actually in control, sovereign, in charge, right? Great destruction is coming upon Jerusalem. The people will be judged, or the people will be, uh, there's a judgment coming upon them. That's an accurate way of putting it. However, hey, don't just come at us out of anger or we'll cease to exist. So judge us, but then ultimately pour out your anger upon the nations that are being used to judge us, okay? But in other words, preserve us in it. Yeah, the jackals are there again. Just Well, it's just a basic concept of the place is going to be desolate and it's just going to be animals running around because the people are all going to be gone. All right?
Yeah. Yeah, people are killed. Yeah, I don't I don't know the numbers or yeah. Yeah. I mean there's some that are carried away. I mean I don't know the total, you know, numbers and how that would all work, but yeah. Yeah. But but put it this way, everyone's going to be pulled out. That's the main thing, right? The place is going to be left desolate. Now, how desolate, how many people, you, you can get into all of those. Just remember, whenever it gives this language, sometimes it's using kind of a poetic way of sometimes speaking of it in very, maybe, I don't want to say hyperbole, but very poetic language to describe it. Is every single person going to be gone? You can have that debate all day because some people will. The bottom line is it's going to be desolate in the sense that the nation is going to be taken, people are going to be killed, and Others are going to be gone, and, well, that's going to be the result of, well, of their idolatry. But it's amazing that as much as they've been warned about idolatry in chapter 10, it's basically telling them the idol is useless compared to God. And, I, again, some view this as more of a warning about them. Don't turn to the idols. You need to turn to God. Your issue isn't you need an idol to help you. You need God to help you. But... They've been around, they were in Egypt for all of those years, and it seems every time they get around the other nations, they watch the other nations turn to idols when things go wrong. You think that they should know better, but they don't. And that's a, a never-ending problem with Israel and with Judah. All right. I think that, that does about as well as we can with that chapter. I mean, we could get into some, you know, little technical things, and, but you get the basic idea of the text. Sounds good? All right, now if we're here Wednesday and everything works out great, chapter 11, um, and then we're going to have to start skipping some things relatively quick. I don't know what, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll figure out, figure out what we can do. All right, but we, we t- knocked out an entire chapter tonight, so some of these chapters can probably go a little faster. We'll see, but then, you, then we're going to have some chapters that cannot go so fast, right? So we'll have to try to just pick and choose. All right, well, we're at now we'll pray. Lord God, we come before you this evening. Lord, we pray that we learn from these passages. We see our own sin, our own idolatry. Lord, on one hand, we don't want to be so superstitious that we fear and create legalism to avoid that which we're not even told to avoid. At the same time, we don't want to be so laxed that we corrupt and mess up the worship of you in some way as well. Help us try to find that balance It's always difficult when we live in a world that does not follow you. But let us constantly look to ourselves to figure out the right way to do things and try to correct it as much as possible. We ask this in Jesus' name. And God's people said...